Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Andrew Seidenberg, Research Director at Truth Initiative. TOPS is organized by Mike Pesco at University of Missouri, C. Shang at The Ohio State University, Michael Darden at Johns Hopkins University, and Jamie Hartman Boyce at University of Oxford. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will now turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Jamie Hartman Boyce from University of Oxford to introduce our speaker. Thank you so much and hello everyone. Today we continue our summer fall 2023 season with a single paper presentation by Vitura Tanakun entitled Purchase Restrictions as Tobacco Control Policy Effect on Adverse Birth Outcomes. This presentation was selected via a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Vitura Tanakun is an economist and assistant professor at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Holding a PhD in economics from Washington State University, his research encompasses econometrics, health economics, health policy, and development economics. He has published on topics including measurement error models, contingent evaluation models, maternal and child health, medical and health related guidelines, behavioral health, and of course, tobacco control policies. Outside of publishing, Tanakun has also secured awards, supervised graduate students, appeared in international media, and refereed journal articles. Our discussant today is Michael Darden from Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Vidura Tanakun, thank you for presenting for us today and over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jami. First, uh, let me share my slides. Uh, okay, again, I'm Vidura Tanakun and today's talk is Purchase Restrictions as a Tobacco Control Policy and Analysis of the Effect on Adverse Birth Outcomes. And this research was supported by two internal grants from Indiana University, Empower and Emergency Equity Fund for Research. Uh, and uh, the researcher did not receive any funding from tobacco related sources during the last 10 years. Here's an overview of the research. The minimum legal sales age, I abbreviate as uh, MLSA here for tobacco products has been used as a tobacco control policy tool for decades and it targets to discourage uh, smoking initiation in, in particular. And uh, at the same time, smoking during pregnancy increases the risk of uh, adverse birth outcomes. This is well known and well established. My target here is to investigate what is the effect of a purchase restriction on the risk of adverse birth outcomes. And the presentation is based on a recent publication with the same title as the title of this presentation, published in Economic Analysis and uh, Policy. And I should also mention that uh, uh, the preliminary work for this paper published in Economic Analysis and Policy was in another paper, which also was published recently in uh, nicotine and tobacco research. Right, here's the, the status of minimum legal sales age of tobacco products around the world. Mm. As many of, uh, many of the audience here might know, in December 2019, the minimum legal sales age for tobacco products in the US was uh, raised to 21 from 18 uh, by passing a federal law. When this was done, USA was the first OECD country to increase the MLSA of tobacco products to 21. However, some other countries, uh, Kuwait, Honduras, Mongolia, Uganda, Sri Lanka, and Ethiopia had raised the age limit to 21 before USA. And after USA, a few more countries raised the age limit to uh, 21. 
uh, those countries included Philippines, Kazakhstan, and, and Singapore. Singapore. Uh, some other countries like uh, New Zealand and Malaysia have announced their intention to introduce uh, uh, tobacco-free generation policies. The idea is to raise the, the MLSA gradually, uh, even beyond 21, um, to, a, to a certain level over the next few years, so that ultimately uh, some people who were, uh, who were born after a specific year, depending on the country, will be banned from purchasing tobacco products. There, it will be a complete ban on some of those who were born uh, after a certain age. However, uh, most of the world, around most of the world, most of the countries, uh, the, the MLSA still remains 18. So that is the most common age. And uh, if you look at the status in the in the US before this law was passed, many US states raised the age limit to 21 before the federal law was passed. And in addition to these states, state level laws, there were other local laws and county level laws within these counties and uh, in other counties where the state level law was not passed. And for this study, I use a period prior to passing the federal law, that is the six years from 2013 to, to 2018. And here's uh, the distribution of smoking prevalence across uh, uh, different uh, age groups uh, among those, uh, those who, were, who were pregnant and uh, gave a uh, gave birth to a, uh, say, gave a live birth during uh, 2011 to 2019. As you can see clearly from uh, from this uh, these graphs, these graphs, these are based on over 40 million observations and it covers all the live births in the US since uh, during 2011 to 2019. You can see that smoking prevalence uh, during pregnancy and at pregnancy peaks at around 21 and uh, the prevalence is very high during uh, 18 to 21 years. That was the the uh, age group targeted by T21 policies, T21 policies, and uh, still high after 21, but uh, then uh, decreases gradually. And uh, once uh, realizing a birthing, someone realizes uh, she is pregnant. The the likelihood of quitting smoking is very high. So during the first uh, trimester, smoking prevalence drops significantly. That happens uh, across all age groups, and it continued to drop during the second and third trimesters. However, this week we can see that this pattern, the prevalence is very high around the age of 21. So that is the status. If I look at the literature, uh, there's uh, some literature on the impact of T21 policies on smoking. Smoking, for example, Friedman and Wu 2020 has estimated uh, approximately a 3.1 percentage point reduction in smoking within this 18 to 21 age group of uh, general population as a result of T T21 policies. And uh, two other working papers, uh, Abok and others, and Brian et al. Brian and others also more or less. Uh, confirm and find something something close to that. That is about the effect of T21 policies on the uh, general population. When it comes to the effect on the, uh, the mm -hmm. pregnant population or, pre or smoking during pregnancy or at pregnancy, there's only one paper, one, one paper that is Yan 2014. And uh, in that paper, uh, they explore the effect of T21 policy on maternal smoking using birth records, as we do here, but uh, but only within the state of Pennsylvania during 1992 to 2002. In uh, 1992, state of Pennsylvania raised the minimum legal sales age for tobacco products to 21, but the policy was reversed a few years later. Uh, they used data but data uh, during this period in a regression discontinuity design and show that about uh, show a 15 percent decline in the daily cigarette consumption during pregnancy and they also find that the regulation was uh, re regulation uh, to uh, cause a decrease of two percentage points in prenatal smoking participation 
without controls, but after adding controls, that uh, statistical significance was gone. So this is the only the only paper directly looking at the effect on uh, maternal smoking during pregnancy. However, uh, there are some estimates using a simulation exercise using the sim stroke model. So that is a, a module, simulation, simulation model used by uh, many policymakers to evaluate the effect of uh, change in policy. Um, so this particular simulation was done by uh, Institutes of Medicine uh, in 2015 to find out what would be the impact on uh, birth outcomes if uh, nationwide, uh, nationwide uh, law was passed to raise the age limit to 21 as, as done in 2019. And they found that uh, such a law would avert 438,000 low birth weight cases, 286,000 pre birth, uh, preterm births, and 4,000 cases of sudden infant uh, death syndrome between 2015 and 2100. However, most of the impact was during the, the initial years. Uh, so, this is the, uh, the uh, available estimate, but that is based on a simulation model, which has been calibrated based on. Uh, Many other many other papers um, uh, which estimates the sensitivity of uh, the policy change to uh, various outcomes. Okay, so this is our model. This is our model. Mm. If we first, if we look at the connection between tobacco purchase restrictions and the birth outcomes, uh, it is it is not difficult to uh, understand. That the that purchase restrictions impact birth outcomes through smoking during during pregnancy. It is unlikely that uh, other in, other channels will impact birth outcomes. So all all almost always purchase restrictions first uh, decrease smoking prevalence, and that then it is expected to uh, affect birth outcomes. So we can we can directly look at the effect of purchase restrictions on birth outcomes, it is likely to be the effect through uh, smoking during pregnancy. I'll start with the, with the objective of the, uh, of the study uh, by defining what I try to measure. Um, measure. What I want to measure is uh, what would be the outcome when someone, when a birthing person is restricted from purchasing tobacco products uh, in that person's neighborhood, um, neighborhood, compared to the counterfactual situation of uh, of uh, not having such a restriction. So these are the the, the two situations. What is the what is the uh, birth outcome if someone is uh, prevented from purchasing tobacco products in in the neighborhood compared to not having such a such a restriction? So that is the uh, target measure, and. Uh, as the first identifying assumption, I, I assume this to be a, a, a constant effect, fixed effect, and uh, I do not consider the possibility of heterogeneous uh, treatment effect, so that is a limitation. Under that assumption, I move to uh, a two-way fixed effects model, uh, econometric model, that is the operational model. In that one, uh, the dependent variable, y i j k is the birth outcome uh, birth outcome at uh, of individual i at uh, at a given county at a given uh, year month uh, and at a given location and uh, then uh, r j k i j k l is the policy indicator policy indicator whether the the person was rest restricted from purchasing tobacco products or not and then i have uh, over 3000 county dummies and uh, the study period covers six years from 2017 to 2018. So I have uh, 72 months. Uh, this ML is those seven dummies for those 72 months. And then I have some control variables. So the identification is, uh, is that uh, identification strategy is based on the homogeneous treatment effect. And uh, I control for these uh, time specific and, uh, and count specific fixed effect. Uh, under un, under the uh, homogeneous treatment effect, this is like an extended uh, difference in difference model um, model. Even though there can be problems, if I uh, allow 
heterogeneous treatment effects. Uh, and these are my data. Uh, I use restricted use US birth records data, which includes all births in the US during 2013 to 2018. Uh, however, only the records of live births by mothers who were 18 to 21 years old at delivery were used for this analysis because they were those, they were the people who were impacted by this policy. And the sample, sample size was 2.65 million. The main outcome variables we are interested in, uh, in are, uh, in is the main outcome variable is an adverse birth outcome, which is defined as uh, a live birth resulting low birth weight, a small for gestational age birth, or a preterm birth, one of these three outcomes. And each of these individual uh, events, outcomes also are, I mean, the effect on each of these three individual outcomes also is analyzed separately. In addition to that, I also check what is the impact on uh, smoking smoking. This is something I have done in the other paper, the, the, the previous paper published in nicotine and tobacco research. But since it is related to this, I, I also uh, verify that in, in this one to check how it first impacts uh, smoking within this uh, age group. Though I have uh, restricted data, I have some information which is not available in public use data. However, still these data are restricted. The location is available uh, up to the county. I have the level, county level, data at county level. And the delivery date is available year and month, but not the exact date. And the age is available in years, not the, not the month. So age of the, the birthing person. So that is one of the uh, kind of... Uh, strict limitations. Other two were not a bigger problem. Uh, I have data up to the count level and the month. Age is uh, not available with uh, that much of precision. Right. And these are the three outcome variables. Uh, low birth rate. Birth rate was uh, less than 2,500 grams and small for gestational age. Birth rate was below uh, 10th percentile conditional on gestation age and gender and uh, preterm birth gestation period was less than 37 weeks. So these are pretty standard. Uh, so these are the uh, outcome variables. Uh, next, uh, I need to explain the policy indicators. So that is where I have spent most of the time uh, time uh, creating the policy indicator. However, before moving to explain that, I will open for uh, any questions on uh, the part I presented so far. Thank you so much. So I'll first invite our discussant, Michael Darden, to ask any questions he might have at this point. And I can also see that some people have already asked questions in the Q&A, which is great. If you have more questions, please enter them. Thanks so much. Yeah, uh, so uh, really interesting work, Bithura. I, I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, I think the slides are uh, really, really helpful as well. Um, so uh, my first question is about the research design. I was a little bit surprised um, you know, there, 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 there was a lot of work on the Affordable Care Act dependent coverage provision where they would use a design in which they looked at, uh, you know, uh, uh, young adults who were affected by the dependent coverage provision under 26 relative to those adults that were just above 26 or 27 through 29 or something like that. I think Kosali Simon has a really well-cited paper that uses that strategy. So I was a little bit surprised that you didn't look at the birth outcomes of 22-year-old women as a kind of control who would always have been uh, able to purchase cigarettes. Um, can you can you comment on that? Yes, it's a good question. In fact, uh, so before before uh, this paper, I was working on uh, another paper too, uh, which was published again just recently on nicotine and tobacco research. In that one, I looked at the effect of T21 uh, policy on uh, on the the smoking behavior in that one i i come i looked at the other group also 21 to uh, 24 as a comparison group some some people have considered this group in a uh, sort of a triple difference framework 
Uh, it was practically very hard to do that. I mean, I will explain later. One reason is my, my policy indicator is not just binary. Uh, in, so in some cases, it is binary, but in some cases, I have a value in between zero and one. That's one reason. In addition to that, if I want a triple difference research design, I need all six combinations of interaction terms terms to be included. So I have over 3,000 uh, 3, county dummies and 72,000 uh, month time periods. So if I multiply mul multiply 3000 by 72, it comes to a very large number. And other com when I add all those combinations, it is not possible to uh, estimate that using a standard uh, software. So as a, because of that, what I did was I as a placebo, I, I estimated separately for the 21 to 24 group, age 21 to 24 group. And I did not find a significant effect. It was it was very tiny. It was not in this paper, but it was in the other paper I published in nicotine and tobacco research. Okay, great. Well, thanks. That 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 helps uh, think about this. Um, I, a question about the timing uh, that's going on here, and and not the kind of policy variation timing that is is you know commonly discussed in the literature, but just in terms of the treatment timing. So. Okay. Uh, if 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 a if a policy turns on on January first and a woman gives birth on January second, right. is, is that person considered treated? Mm. Okay, so I okay, so I I considered the the policy uh, uh, on the uh, second month of pregnancy. Okay. Uh, I, I looked because I, I can identify smoking status during the first trimester, which means during the first to third month of uh, of pregnancy. So I got the middle point, middle point uh, as the middle point. I looked at the second month. The second month of pregnancy is yeah, when the second month of pregnancy. Okay, okay. Well, that's helpful. Um, and and uh, last question. I mean, so I've got some other thoughts that I'll save for the end in terms of big picture and kind of going forward, but. Um, just on the on the on the research design. So, if I'm if I'm understanding correctly, you're looking at a sample of of live births, right? And and so a, a, an outcome here could be fetal death. That's definitely going to be related to smoking, right? So, like just to get right. into your sample, there's kind of a selection problem associated with with smoking to begin with. So, can you can you comment on that? Uh... What do you mean by sam sample? Okay, so so miscarriages, uh, miscarriages, fetal demises. Uh, yes, know, yes. I, can be affected this, by your smoking yeah. variable, in, right? In in this work, uh, I did not do that. Uh, so I I was planning to check the impact of uh, the 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 selection before birth, like due to abortions and miscarriages, and uh, I had a I had some data limitation. I had to apply for restricted. Uh, data and get that. I, I got that, but uh, due to some limitations, uh, I was not able to control for that selection. Uh, that, that was not done here. I, can you give some sense about the extent of the bias, which direction that would go? Uh, mm, I need to... Uh, I, 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 need to, I need to think about that. So... Uh, uh, I did not have a chance to do that analysis. There is there is some possibility of uh, some selection. I have done that in in some of my other work. It was it has not been published, but for that I use NSFG. Uh, in that one, at least uh, uh, on what I did, I did not find a significant effect effect. Uh, but I am not sure whether it was due to the statistical power or actually not having a effect it was a small data set compared to this it would have been ideal if i could do that uh, using this data set but there are two problems i have data about infant deaths and miscarriages but i don't have data about uh, intentional abortions so, so that is another another limitation uh, so even if i do it does not give me the full freak picture particularly because abortions lo laws were different across different areas it impacts differently so it is somewhat complex. Uh, I I haven't done that uh, here. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll, I'll okay. Back to Jamie. For... Thank you so much. Um, 
I'm actually not going to go in order because the last question that's come in just like tails on the back of that very closely. So I think I'll just acknowledge that question, which is around whether smoking young people um, in young people might influence their choice to have an abortion. So I think you've kind of answered that for us and that you don't have access uh, to that data. But but I think the person asking the question is wondering if the composition of mothers caring to term might somehow change after MLSA changes and also commented at the same point about miscarriages and stillbirths. Uh, so I think we've heard you reflect on that, but if there's anything else you'd like to add to that, please do so. Yeah, I am. So that is an, an area that I'm interested, I'm working on. I have my interest there, but here I haven't done much work on that. That's Thank it. you. Um, and another couple of questions, just to clarify, is this a study of purchase restrictions? which apply to the person buying the product or sales restrictions, which apply to the seller? Uh, so these were uh, uh, sale. I mean, it is a little bit complex because I, I looked at individual laws. Uh, so there were some differences in, uh, in individual laws. Uh, so a little bit uh, fuzzy area, but some some in some some jurisdictions, even possessing cigarettes is illegal. Uh, so the answer is it is it is a little bit uh, complex issue. I I look this as uh, as uh, say uh, uh, sales restriction. I initially used the term purchase restriction, but then uh, uh, there was some uh, discussions with the referee. Uh, and change that to a sales restriction. Okay. Thank it's a little you. bit of a fuzzy area. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, two more quick questions before we get back to your presentation. One is around the age range that you chose to study. So a question here, shouldn't you study people aged 18 to 20 at time of birth since it is legal to sell tobacco to people who are 21? Uh let me explain that in in, in next slides. Right, it is perfect. A bit tricky. Okay. Okay. We will shelve that for a minute. And right. finally, the question: Did all states that adopted the policy adopt it on the same date? And a kind of follow up question from the same questioner: What is the weakness and strength of assuming the homogenous treatment effect for pregnant women? Which policy is affected in different trimesters of pregnancy? Uh, I. Okay, so homogeneous impact means so I'm, I'm I have the entire population here. It is not a sample. Uh, so in in one way, I'm I'm looking at the impact on this population population, and I have all the, all the data. Uh, so in one way, when I say homogeneous effect, what, what I look at is the average effect of this entire population. So I, I can uh, mm -hmm. I can think about it as in in this way. Uh, mm -hmm. However, if I want to look at the impact. Uh, at different at, at one state individually or one area it it may not be equal to the uh, this average effect okay okay thank you in the interest of time i'm going to move us on but there will be more opportunities for questions and discussion coming right. up right so so next part i i have answers to most of the technical uh, questions so because most of the work i have here were on related to uh, creating this policy indicator so this is, I, I will quickly explain this and I will explain this in detail. So I first prepared the data set of localities where uh, MLSA of tobacco products was changed due to T21 or T19 policies during our study period, together with the effective dates of these, these uh, policy changes. Because in many cases, the policy was, the uh, some act was introduced, but it was implemented uh, at a later date, so I, I searched uh, uh, official documentation as much as possible to find out the exact date when, when these policies were implemented. And this information was gathered, the, the basic information was gathered mostly from Tobacco 21 organization where they have, uh, they have kind of archived most of the uh, newspaper articles and uh, uh, web pages related to these such changes. And then I went to the websites of say counties or states. For states, it was clear the information was widely available, but for cities and counties, uh, 
they were not available at one place. So I tried to collect this information and prepare the data set. Then I used this information to find the extent of coverage of T21 or T19 laws in each county during each month based on the proportion of the population living in a covered area. I will explain this in detail again. Then we derive the probability that each birthing person is banned from purchasing tobacco products in that person's uh, locality based on the person's county of residence and age of pregnancy. Uh, and then age of pregnancy was not uh, available, but uh, I have the delivery date and uh, the gestation age using that I back calculated to find out uh, the, the date of conception and the, the, the period of uh, pregnancy. And uh, so several uh, changes were done. I will, I will ex explain each of them one by one now. Okay, uh, if I start with statewide T21 policies during this period, uh, six states, six US states and Washington DC introduced statewide uh, T21 laws during this period. Uh, for these, these states, information is widely available. It is very clear. So once there was a statewide policy, the, the policy indicator changed from zero to one at uh, one particular date. So here I uh, I look at one month, so I ignore what happened within a month. So uh, and based on the date of implementation, I uh, I make one or zero. Um, I mean, depending on the, on the month. So each month I assign a value of one or zero when the when the policy change from um, from zero to one. And uh, however, that is not. Uh, straightforward because in in some states there were grandparenting clauses. So, for example, how I raised MLSA from eighteen to twenty one to be effective from January first, twenty sixteen. However, the law excluded those who were already twenty one. So that means the effect was gradual uh, for a period of uh, three years. So whether a person was, was restricted from purchasing tobacco or not, uh, depended not only whether the, the person was living in uh, this area at a given date, but it also depended on the exact age, whether the person was 18 years and like six months or 19 years and two months or, or whatever, okay? So it is it was not just whether the person lived in that particular county at that particular month, but also the exact age. But if we look at a state like California, they did not have a grandparenting clause. So that means everyone, including those who were legally allowed to uh, buy purchase tobacco products by that day, were banned from purchasing tobacco uh, once, the, once the law was implemented. Uh, I mean, so someone was like 20 years at that point, but who has been purchasing uh, tobacco products for two years, but from this date onwards, that person cannot purchase tobacco products. Mm. And uh, other states and localities follow one of these two models. For example, uh, uh, Maine uh, followed Hawaii and introduced a grandparenting clause. Uh, other states like New Jersey and Oregon followed California's model and did not include the grandparenting clause. So I checked for each case, I checked whether uh, there was a grandparenting clause or not. And depending on that, I, I was careful to assign that indicator to a person uh, by uh, looking at the uh, ex exact age. Okay, so this is a display of how these policies were implemented. In Hawaii, it was gradual and California that was done at one point. So this is one, one complication I had to address and I did address this. And many counties in the above six states did not wait until a statewide T21 law was passed to implement a countywide T21 law. So for example, uh, Hawaii County in Hawaii and Kern and San Francisco counties in California and Lane County in Oregon passed a law before a, a state law was in effect. So when the state law was in was effective, everyone within the state was restricted. But uh, but even before that, 
some people who were lived in a county were restricted from purchasing tobacco products. And uh, when that happened, I changed from zero to one and uh, uh, also checking the age when there was a grandparenting clause. And several other counties in other states, which did not uh, implement a statewide law, also implemented countywide laws. So, uh, for example, some uh, counties in Alaska, Arizona, Colorado, Kansas, Minnesota, Missouri, Mississippi, and New York implemented a countywide T21 law during the study period. So then I assigned a value of 0 or 1 by looking at whether the, the county had a law or not, and also the age. Uh, so they varied in their approach towards grandparenting clauses and following the same approach as for states, we changed the policy indicator of birth in paper people in these counties after the applicable effective days. And in addition to county level laws, there were at least 300 uh, local laws, city level or other, other local bodies. They also implemented laws. So this wanted some additional work, work additional treatment. Uh, in most of the, the prior work, they haven't looked at these uh, county, level, uh, county level laws. If I ignore that, I kind of, uh, I, I, I consider some of the treated cases as untreated. So I looked at uh, these uh, local areas also. Uh, many localities within one within the county implemented uh, a policy before the, the county law came into effect effect in some cases some city councils were uh, were spread uh, across more than one county but in many cases they were a part of a county so the the bottom line is uh, some areas within counties were uh, were affected by a law before a county implemented. I had to uh, somehow uh, assign the correct value for these ones. However, in my model, a person is identified, the location is identified up, up to the county level. So I can't go, um, say, go inside the council level, county level to identify the exact location and know whether a person was uh, was impacted by uh, by the local law or not exactly. What I know is, some parts of a county was was restricted in some within some parts of the county there were restrictions so if a birthing person lived in one of those counties there was a probability that uh, that the, the that the person lived in one of those areas and were restricted from purchasing tobacco products so this is how i address for example this is an example of barnstable county in massachusetts within the barnstable county uh, Yarmouth, uh, uh, say, the, the local area, city or area, implemented a T21 policy on uh, July 1st, uh, 2014. And the population in that uh, city was 22,467, which represented 10.52% uh, of the county's population. So that means uh, since this date, 10% uh, of the population in this particular county were restricted from purchasing tobacco products in, in, in the neighborhood. Neighborhood. Mm, neighborhood. But I, I can't identify whether a person lived in this neighborhood. So what I did was, if the person lived on this county on that particular day, I assigned the probability 0.1052 uh, to that policy indicator because a person was... Uh, uh, 10% likely to be restricted from purchasing tobacco products in the neighborhood. And on 15, 2015, September, September, uh, another, say, locality, Brewster, introduced that. So this probability increased to 15%. And uh, as more and more uh, towns or cities introduced, followed the, the, the previous one, followed the neighbor and introduced uh, T21 policies, this percentage coverage increased. When it when once it reached sixty eight percent or sixty seven percent, county level law was implemented. So after that day, entire county was covered. I looked at each county and uh, calculated the probability of coverage during each month uh, in in this manner. In this manner, okay. So 
This is how the coverage changed. Coverage of T21 laws changed in each county in uh, Massachusetts. In December 2012, the blue means zero, probability is zero. None of the counties uh, were covered, but uh, in one county, some parts were covered. So this shows the probability. And uh, after two years, that probability increased and this, this spread to restrictions spread to some other counties. By 2016, this is the picture. By 2018, and everyone lived in this county were covered. So based on this, I assign a value of zero, one, or a value in between. Also con considering uh, the age, if there are grandparenting clauses. Uh, and uh, I also looked at a few other things, which I will explain. So, uh, so this is uh, what I did. And here's the coverage by December 18th. 2018, that is the end of the our uh, study period. Study period. Uh, though I have many counties uh, where the, a person was covered with a probability in between zero and one, in most cases, it is either one or zero. One or zero. However, I considered the other cases also. Uh, but this is not only that. There were other, other, other paths for this policy indicator to vary. Uh, there were T19 laws in some states and some counties before T21 laws were implemented. So those who were, who were 19 were not impacted by these laws because they were, for them, the restrictions were in place even from the beginning. And uh, the T21 policy impacted those who were 20 or 21. 21 or 21. So I had to consider that also. That is another dimension. And finally, finally, I did not have the exact age at pregnancy uh, because age was measured up to a year. So there was a possible range of uh, a 12 month period. I calculated that probability for each of these 12 months and got an average uh, so that I have the expected value. So that is the last thing I did. I did. So I did all these things to construct my uh, policy indicator to run the previous model. So before moving to the results section, now I will stop for uh, questions because most of the work I have done were in were here. Thank you so much. So again, I'm going to hand over to Michael Darden first for a couple questions as discussing. I think let's be mindful of the time, um, just in that we have 15 minutes left. Sure. Yeah. I, I, um, I what my, my main question is really about the results, but I, I think I can ask it now anyway. Um, uh, so I think this heterogeneous or the homogeneous treatment uh, treatment assumption. Uh, treatment effect assumption is, is important here. Um, there's a recent paper by uh, a researcher named Joanna Zensis at the um, University of St. Gallen in Switzerland, um, who has done a lot of work thinking about the um, heterogeneity of the treatment effect of smoking on a variety of different birth outcomes. And she finds using some state-of-the-art kind of machine learning methods that she um, specifically the causal forest stuff of uh, uh, athe and imbens, um, she finds that really a lot of the effect of smoking on bad birth outcomes are driven by older uh, women. So women of advanced maternal maternal age. So I was a little bit surprised, and, and I guess you're about to talk about your results, but I was a little bit surprised uh, about how big your results are. And so I, I was wondering if you could tell us just the applied effect of smoking on birth outcomes that come out of your results for a relatively young group of, of pregnant women. So, uh, do, do it, okay, uh, do it is related to the results? Or shall, we, shall we discuss after the results or? Yeah, if it's better to just go to the results. I was I was thinking we would get to the uh, yeah. after results, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that would be if you could if you could talk about the applied effect of smoking on birth outcomes here from your results, that would be great. Uh, so, uh, 
what it shows is that uh, there's there, there is a benefit on uh, health outcomes if uh, i mean smoking is prevented but i think uh, the effect of smoking on birth outcomes is supported by research that is i mean the the, the issue is on the magnitude exact magnitude uh, so based on uh, my identifying assumption this is what i find so the assumptions i have explained uh, there may be many many other things going on so if i if i look at uh, i mean if i break it down into say separate components and if i look at the effect on a specific group it may be different but um, uh, i'm i'm not sure whether the effect on this particular age group has been uh, has been uh, studied do you think yeah so i, I think i think my what yeah, i what yeah. i find Maybe what's really big in your in your effects here are the are the effects of these laws on on the smoking uh, behavior. Right. You cite you know some literature where essentially you know when you control for things there is no effect <laughs> for on pregnant women right uh, in the Yan study in 2014. So you know in order to get these kind of 10 20 percent reductions in uh, bad birth outcomes. Uh, you know, you would need some pretty significant effects to on, on smoking. Uh, so I guess that's like the first the first thing that I was yeah, just yeah yeah yeah. I yeah, yeah yes, I yeah okay. So I do have the effect on smoking also uh, also. Uh, so probably, I mean, based on the impact on smoking prevalence, maybe it is uh, it is possible. Maybe because I do see some significant effect on smoking prevalence also. Uh, I think I think yeah. Fedora. Let's go on to yeah. your results. Yeah. I really don't want to run out of time, and yeah. I suspect some of this might okay. be answered there. Yeah. Thank yeah. you both yeah. very much. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so this is this is a quick summary. I mean, before before going to my my uh, say difference in uh, sorry to a fixed effects model in the data sample, fourteen point five percent were facing an age based restriction when purchasing tobacco at pregnancy. This rate in, rate increased from. 10.9% in 2013 to 23.1% in 2018. So by 2018, 23.1% was restricted from purchasing tobacco products uh, uh, in, in some way. And uh, parallel to this, their smoking prevalence at the beginning of pregnancy decreased from uh, from 17.1% in 2013 to 12.1% in 2018 and from 12.7 percent to 8.8 uh, percent, 8 percent during the first trimester of pregnancy. But these are basically uh, summary uh, statistics. And 19 percent of these birthing people were living in a county where at least 50 percent of the county population were living in a locality with a 2021 law. I don't use this. 50% cutoff in my econometric model, but here, just for comparison, I separate them into two groups um, based on whether the, the, the county during that particular month was covered at least 50% by, by a restrictive law or not. And birth outcomes in those restrictive counties were noticeably better than in other areas. For example, the prevalence of low birth rate in restrictive counties was only 8% compared to 9.3% in other counties, while the prevalence of uh, preterm birth was 10.6% compared to 12.5%, and the gap in the prevalence of uh, uh, small for gest gestational age across restrictive and non-restrictive counties was also positive, 10.3% compared to 9.7%. And the prevalence of uh, adverse birth outcome based on the aggregate measure of in restrictive counties was 20.1%, uh, while that was 21.3% in uh, other counties. And here's the result for purchase restrictions on smoking. Uh, in this one, this is related to a question Michael asked. So for smoking and pregnancy, that is the month when 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 a birthing person became pregnant. So that is the delivery date minus the uh, gestation period. So that way I uh, worked out the point in pregnancy. And smoking during pregnancy is based on the second month of pregnancy. And the uh, smoking during 
second trimester is based on the, the uh, restrictions prevailed during the third, fifth month of pregnancy and the smoking during the third trimester is based on the eighth month of uh, uh, pregnancy. So based on this, using this framework, I find out, uh, uh, so for, for this group at, at pregnancy, I see a 37% reduction. And uh, during the first and second trimesters, I find a 46% reduction. During the third trimester, I do not uh, find a significant re reduction. So I do find a significant uh, reduction, uh, reduction um, in smoking. And with this, with this, I move to the effect of birth outcomes. So this is uh, what I find. Uh, so the overall, the uh, effect on adverse birth outcomes is a two percentage point reduction on a, uh, on a baseline level of uh, 21%. So that is like a 10 percentage point reduction. And the low birth weight, uh, it was... Uh, 1.2% uh, percent percentage point reduction on 9.1%, mm. and preterm birth, 1.9% on 12.2%, and small for gestational age, uh, 0.0033 on a baseline of 0.982. Uh, uh, or 9.82%, 9.82%, okay? Uh, so these two numbers, in my view, kind of... Uh, compares well. So if uh, smoking pre reduction in smoking prevalence of this magnitude is possible, uh, I think uh, I think a significant reduction in birth outcomes also could be possible. Uh, however, I have I have limitations. Then when it comes to limitations, this is the 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 biggest assumption. I assume the homogeneous effect. So uh, you are correct, Michael is correct. So if the uh, effect can be heterogeneous, if so, uh, it can have an impact on this. So I need to, uh, I need to uh, say, investigate that further in any future work. And then uh, there's a possibility of other tobacco control policies, tobacco control policies. So the main assumption is that no other factor except the implementation of an age-based purchase restriction policy affected the birth outcomes on average at, in, at the exact point in time. However, this assumption could be invalid if other tobacco control policies also were implemented together with, uh, together with purchase age restrictions. And this did happen in some jurisdictions. So to circumvent this issue, some of the previous researchers have employed a triple difference research design, uh, but uh, I explained this earlier in response to Michael. So uh, I could not do exactly the same thing. Uh, however, um, uh, here I included uh, tobacco, state tobacco taxes and state level smoke free laws as controls. That is one thing I did. Uh, when I was estimating the effect of uh, smoking prevalence, I also did a sort of a placebo test on the 21 to 24 age group. Mm, which were not impacted uh, by this policy, this this, this policy. Um, so there, I did not find a significant effect on uh, smoking of that group, uh, that group. And another, another uh, issue is uh, border crossing, possible border crossing, particularly since I'm looking at very small areas, even within counties, it is very much possible that they will they will purchase uh, tobacco products from some other uh, local areas um, even though i included these these uh, small areas also for the sake of uh, having having a say um, complete and more accurate picture of the change in policy uh, the results are not sensitive to uh, these small areas um, and also um, I have excluded uh, some of the small areas, even including Washington DC uh, to check the effect of border crossing, but the results are mm, somewhat comparable. Uh, even if they don't change very much even after excluding uh, these small areas and just leave the, the larger states. And finally, smoking status is self-reported. So that also uh, is a limitation. Mm. So these are the limitations. 
And finally, there are there are some issues to be looked at. One thing is uh, what you suggested the the selection at the uh, before pregnancy, um, before 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 birth due to miscarriages and uh, abortions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I have investigated that using some other data set, uh, data set, but uh, I haven't done that using these uh, birth records. Uh, Abortion data are not available anyway. Mm, that is one limitation. And also, uh, there can be a, say, heterogeneous effect. Uh, that is uh, another area that I'm, I'm working on. So uh, they are all, all future work or areas that I'm currently looking at. In, in this work, I do have these limitations. So based on the assumptions, uh, I have, uh, I have found out these effects. Uh, so most of the contribution was in correctly, uh, say, uh, correctly constructing the policy indicator to identify uh, identify exactly whether a person was restricted from purchasing tobacco products uh, or not in that person's neighborhood at, at the given date. So there are a few more minutes. I will stop here for any uh, final questions or comments. Wonderful, thank you. Michael, did you have any more questions at this point? I'll, I'll, I'll let it, I'll open it up for, for yeah. general. Okay, great. So we have one more general question um, and then just a reminder that there will be a top of the tops opportunity after this to ask more questions of our presenter. Um, so just one question here, have you explored the robustness of your results to any of the newer DID estimators that address bias from heterogeneous treatment effects? Or can you do a bacon decomp to show that your estimate is relying on clean treated versus control comparisons? I did not do. One reason was, as I explained, uh, my, uh, my, 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 my treatment indicator is not just binary. So I have, I have assigned a value in between zero and one for some of the uh, observations. So it is a little bit complex. So I can't use that uh, decomposition directly uh, so I need to think about how to how to use the idea and do that. So great, thank you very much. Are there any more questions before I hand over to our MC? I think I'll hand over to our MC. We are out of time. However, if you still have burning questions or thoughts for Dr. Tenakun. You can join us for Top of Tops, an interactive group discussion offered immediately following select Tops events this season. To join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL posted in the chat and switch rooms with us once this event concludes. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 138 people for your participation. Have a Tops Notch weekend.